So I tried for the most provocative title that I could come up with for my, for my talk here. Who came because the title was kind of fun? That's it? All right. Who came because they're, they're satisfying some requirement of going to enough of these? None? Okay. Um, one of these days I'm going to come up with a stand-up comedy act for analytics because I think that's maybe the thing I'm at. I'm, like I, I think I'm a funny person, so maybe, maybe, and I'm a crappy data scientist, so like maybe that's what I'll be good at. So we all have to find our competitive, comparative advantage, right? I mean, we have to figure out what we're good at relative to everybody else. And I can almost guarantee that all of you are better coders than I am. Um, my uh, my background's a little a little weird to be in this space, um, and I think it's it's. It's given me a perspective that I hope is useful to you in the next 30 or 40 minutes of talking. Um, who leads a data science team? A couple of you, all right. And how about um, individual contributors? The rest, and then the remainder of you do what? What do you do? Looking for work? Who's, who's, who's looking for employment? Okay, well, that's fun. All right. Uh, so feel free to follow me if you want. Uh, the name, the, the, my company's name is Data IQ. Um, I know it's tough to spell. Sometimes people think it's Japanese. It's not necessarily Japanese. We actually started in France, um, and we've moved the corporate headquarters to the U.S. Typically, we we spell it Data uh, Data IQ as one word, and it's the combination of Haiku for structure and data uh, is obvious. Okay, uh, I'll I'll do a little advertisement at the very very end. We can cut it off if we want, but um, let's get to the meat of the talk here. So I think what's kind of important is to is to get a little bit of background on on who I am and how I how I got here and why you're listening to me. Um, so that was me most of my life. All right, I was like the I, I'm a weird. I'm a weird guy. My dad was a salesman. My mom was a school teacher. I thought I wanted to be uh, a you know athlete for the longest time, and then I decided no, I'm going to be a teacher and so a professor. So I went and I went to a lot of school, and I thought I wanted to be a, a college professor, and I got out and I did that, and it was a tremendous amount of fun. And so you know the 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 athlete sort of turned into like the the geeky athlete. I always joke that the Ken doll thing. So I have a I have a, a very good friend that um, has sort of coined this concept of being underestimated, right? And um, it's good to be underestimated. Sometimes it can give you a chip, put a chip on your shoulder, but at the same time, uh, it's maybe not a bad idea for people to believe that you're one thing and then you uh, kill them with competence in the other direction, right? So, uh, so anyway. Um, that that's sort of my transition in life, and I've moved around a little bit enough to where I'm not exactly sure where I if I wear glasses or not anymore. I I, I can't tell. Um, but if you tell yourself long long enough uh, that you're something, you'll start to believe it. And so for a while, I believed that I wanted to be a uh, data science a college professor, and then I moved into the data science space, and then I now move into like the the talking about data science and organizing data science and and thinking about how data science production works. And so um, we all need to sort of examine who we are and how we fit in to analytics. I tweeted out earlier today, yes, that's a shameless plug for Economics, which is my Twitter handle, that if you're not making software, using software, or selling software in a couple of years, you're gonna be in trouble, right? And we're all in the software business, so we're in good shape. There's a lot of big companies out there, and I do get to deal with a lot of them, that are figuring that out, and employees in those companies are figuring it out. Uh, we're, we're gonna get there. It's just taking time. Uh, I did a great interview this morning, with, or a podcast with Jeff Chow. Jeff's not in the room, is he? So Jeff it works at Heroku, and we were talking about how, how different companies, where, where different companies are in their maturity towards, dig, towards digital transformation. Um, and everybody's at a different stage. And uh, just because we're, we don't work at a, uh, so, so a lot of us probably work at tech companies, full, and we're full stack data scientists. Most of the world's not that way, all right? 
we kind of forget that the rest of the world is catching up, especially in the valley, right? Like, no, we, we have no perspective of how far back a lot of the rest of the world happens to be. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> my algo years. So after I taught, I jumped to a uh, machine learning company actually in the valley, and I spent a year there. If any of you, uh, you know, follow, jump on LinkedIn, you'll see quickly where I was, and you probably all know it. Uh, great year. I enjoyed it. I learned a tremendous amount. Um, that was my second stint in algorithms, and so I worked for the SAS Institute for a long time. And uh, the SAS Institute has, of course, made SAS software for many years. Anybody actually use SAS in here? One. Hey, that's pretty good. Um, so so um, SAS is great software. You know, I always sort of tell the story that, uh, you know, SAS suffers from an image problem, right? Like, imagine if this Mac wasn't pretty and it was, like, super, uh, super ugly, right? It just filled with a lot of good stuff. All right? SAS sort of, like, it's got... You know, it's really good software. It just has a legacy I issue, right? That it has a hard time getting getting past. Anyway, I worked in advanced analytics R&D in the algo side. Then I worked for a machine learning company in the algo side, and I learned something that's I I will never I will never let go, and that's that algos are great, but they don't solve the problem, right? It's not about algos. It's about putting it into practice. Okay, great, your AUC is where it is. The AUC of a slightly worse model is not that bad either. The problem is you struggle to get it into production. The problem is you have no way to update things. All right, that's the problem. So I finally learned, because I'm not that smart, it, that the value of all analytics is in production. So we, as analytics people, need to figure out a way to actually put models into production. And so what I want to talk about today is the way that we can combine resources to put models into production. All right. Uh, so uh, show of hands here, how many data engineering type people are there, like uh, pipelining? If I said data pipeliners, how many of those people are there out there? Okay. And then how many pure analytics people? Like they, they use random forests and gradient boosted machines and deep learning and GPU stuff and all that. Okay. And then the remainder maybe we're figuring it out, okay? So we're gonna talk about value, the value of analytics in production uh, with the notion, and a lot of you sort of know this, that it's production data science which is leading disruption, right? You look at Airbnb and, face, and, and really Facebook, the original, right? But Airbnb and Uber and Mint.com and LearnVest and you know, I talked to a guy from Clue earlier today or yesterday. Um, really, it's taking data science, packaging it in a convenient way, putting it into production that's actually causing disruption. And the rest of the world, the non-Valley world, is str still trying to catch up with that. Right? So you look at the big retailers in Arkansas. All right? You talk about the big insurance companies in the Midwest. They all want to get there. They're not quite there yet. Uh, some of this talk is aimed at the big companies. Right? How does the big company get there? How do they organize behavior? All right? And the takeaway that I want to leave you with is Voltron. <laughs> Does anybody remember Voltron? That's it. I, I, I have to have more hands up for Voltron. Voltron is like the coolest cartoon. Was it in the 80s? I guess it was the 80s. So who knows Voltron? We had like three hands for Voltron. You know Voltron. All right. What was Voltron? Yeah, like yelled the, out all these cats, right? And then they sort of like globbed together and to accomplish this giant, awesome, butt-kicking robot, right? Like you would wait the whole episode. Yes. Yes. It was, uh, my God, it, Voltron was great, right? It's like Transformers, but the Transformers collaborated, all right? It's collaborative Transformers. Um, so here's my point. There will never be enough full-stack data scientists, ever. And I know here in the Valley, you're all going, shut up. You know, there's plenty of full-stack data scientists to go around. But let me tell you, outside the Valley, they're really hard to find. We'll, we'll define a full-stack data scientist in a second. But it is hard to find full-stack data scientists. Uh, so what are their requirements? We'll get into that. Um, how do we, I have a, what I think is a decently unique way to deal with the shortage. 
The other focus is where do, academ where do data scientists come from? What academic divisions do they come from? All right, and this is really important. How many computer science people are in here? Like came from computer science? Okay, for people at home, that's like a third. Uh, how about from st statistics proper? Couple, uh, social sciences? That's like econ, finance, stuff like that. Uh, hard sciences, chemistry, math, stuff like that. All right, so by far, computer science. Okay, so we'll, I'll, don't worry. I, I am guaranteed to insult each and every one of you at some point in this talk. All right, that's sort of my goal. If you don't insult one per, if you don't insult everybody at least once, you've you've failed miserably. Uh, and then we're going to talk to different disciplines, uh, and then potentially talk about how to build teams for different purposes. Okay, who who has not seen this one before? This is the uh, one of the Venn diagrams talking about data science. Right? So in the data science world, you know, you have, you put together somebody with hacking skills and math and statistics skills and, and, and substance, uh, substantive expertise and, and the, the intersection of all of these is, is what we call like the data scientist. And this was the first attempt to categorize what a data scientist was. All right? Um, you know, it assumes homogeneity of his skills in each circle. And that's probably just not right. You know, not everyone with hacking skills has the same hacking skills. Not everyone with math and science skills have the same math and science skills. Not everyone with uh, substantive expertise is the, has the same quality expertise. All right? Uh, but if you have a little bit of all those things, you can call yourself a data scientist. Some folks even call themselves a data scientist, and they only have maybe one. All right? Uh, and then uh, someone came along and put, a, put together a more complicated version and broke it down by algorithms and somehow found that the intersection of knowing all these little different things made you a data scientist. So jack of all trades, master of none, right? That, that, that is the next evolution of, of how to think about a data scientist. I propose something completely different. Instead, I don't call people data scientists. I think they come from the data sciences, okay? There's no such thing as a data scientist. It doesn't exist. I know there are programs out there in data science, and there are programs out there in analytics, but even those programs are bringing people from other places. There is no single set of skills to be a data scientist. You actually have to have a bunch of different skills, and odds are your team has to have a bunch of different skills, because data science is a team sport, okay? so. Let's talk about the team sport. The first of the data scientists that I want to introduce is the biostatistician. Any stat biostatisticians or statisticians in here? One, that's it. Statistics, computational statistics. What's that? All right, there you go, perfect. So you will get to be the first person that I insult, all right? So where do your data come from? And you know, why is this important? Because you need to think, I work, for this, I work for a certain kind of company. My company deals with these kinds of data, primarily, right? They also need to solve these kinds of problems. So see this from the perspective of, where can I go out and find talent? Where should I be recruiting? Because we're not, tell me your name in the back of the room. Alyssa. We're not all as lucky to have Alyssa's self-identify. Sometimes we have to go get them. If you've ever talked to any recruit, who's actively talked to a recruiter in the, the, lately? Okay, it's a, don't put your hands up too, like don't turn towards the camera, right? Because then your boss is gonna know what's going on. But, you know, the, the, the issue with a lot of recruiters, right, is they, they see the business application, they see that you've worked in an industry, they don't see X's and Y's, and data scientists see X's and Y's, right? We know that the X's and Y's across all industries are pretty much the same, all right? It's, it's really that, um, you know, that, that uh, it's the interpretation, right, that ends, up being, that, that ends up being different. So let's talk about what a biostatistician is good at. First of all, their data come from experimental lab, right? I mean, it's great, we run, we run little trials, we kill rats, and, right, I mean, we put rats out there, we give them stuff, and then they die. So we're really good at that. Uh, so what kind, of what kind of companies do, do these, do, like, get these kinds of data? All right, uh, a lot of market research type companies obviously do run experimental type design. 
All right, your favorite tool, of course, is GLM. All right, I, I was a social scientist, right? So GLM, does everyone know GLM? Hands up if you don't, it's okay. All right, short answer is it's a number, roughly an umbrella term which brings a bunch of regression concepts together, okay? So uh, for the biostatistician, they love GLM. Their strengths, of course, are in experimental design. What are their weaknesses? Data created in the real world. Now, most companies' data are created in the real world. So um, is, is a biostatistician perhaps a great um, forecaster? Maybe not. All right. So if I need to build a team that is primarily doing A-B testing, okay, maybe, maybe they're a decent, maybe they're a decent uh, type person. Uh, for all these, I'm gonna, my most offensive thing is, is of course, what picture comes to mind when I think of a biostatistician, it's a Petri dish. All right, so when I think of a biostatistician, this is what I think about. They, they have experimental data from the lab, their favorite tool is GLM, their strengths are experimental design, their struggles are re with real world data, at least out of the box, okay? Survey statisticians, what are they good at? Experimental and observational data, comes from the government, uh, the current population survey, American community survey. These are both you know, typical, typical data sets. What are their favorite tools? Replicate weights, regression. Uh, their strengths are survey methodology. Okay, great for market research. Weaknesses, they tend not to know a whole lot about advanced predictive techniques. So they don't spend a lot of time with lasso. They don't spend a lot of time with trees. Okay, they don't spend a lot of time with deep learning because their goal is interpretation, all right? So if you've got an interpretation need, look to survey statisticians. They actually know a lot, okay? And of course, uh, you have census enumerator as your, as your uh, picture. All right, now my favorite. How many, from, how many people come from the finance, econ, social science background? It's gotta be at least one or two in here. Finance or econ? Yeah, or s econ, all right, same? Yeah, Geogra geography, political science, sociology. What did you guys study? All right, so anyway, so here's, this one's the most fun for me because of course I'm making fun of myself. What are we good at? Secondary data and observational data, all right? So we're not, we're not actively collecting, right? We're sort of passively collecting. Uh, retail applications, this is perfect, this is exactly what you get, okay? Favorite tool, of course, is linear regression. Really, really good at OLS, all right? What's the problem? Or, or what, what are they also, what do they understand? The data generating process. So is this, is this a term, this is probably a term that you haven't heard a lot, heard, heard many times before, and oftentimes with predictive modeling and machine learning, you don't really care, okay? But the data generating process is how the observation was created. And so, um, Oftentimes, failing to acknowledge how data were created will lead you to very poor results in interpretation. You know, um, I, was, I was quoted on uh, some sort of uh, internet thing about the, the, the sales of the Amazon uh, Alexa Echo. Is it Echo? Is that what it's called? Alexa. Amazon, why am I spacing on this thing? It's a tube, okay? So, so right up till Christmas, they were selling a whole lot of them. And then the handful of days before Christmas, the sales went to zero, all right? And then they picked back up in late December. Was the demand zero during those days? Did they sell, did they sell zero? They, so, they sold zero, but the zero didn't mean zero. And that's something that gets lost all the time when you don't think about the data generating process. In fact, it makes you a bit of a skeptic about all data analysis. When you start looking at, uh, you start looking at distributions, right? I start thinking, well, does that mean what it means? Could the zero mean something else? Does missing is, it the, is the right way to capture this in, is a missing value? All right, we don't talk about missing values a lot in, in, in machine learning, all right? Maybe we should. Anyway, statistician, uh, excuse me, uh, economists spend a lot of time thinking about that problem, data quality problems. What are their weaknesses, of course? They have very few techniques beyond linear regression. So they know OLS, they just don't know anything else, okay? 
And that's not true of all economists. We're getting there. All right, we're just a little slower to the slower to the party. What do I think about with economists? Does anybody know who this is? I'm getting to the point where nobody knows who this is. Come on, I have to have one in here. Who, how many Ghostbusters fans out there are there? Ghostbusters, the greatest movie ever. All right, one. So. <clears throat> That's Rick Moranis, right? And actually, he played an accountant in Ghostbusters. But I realized that I probably wasn't like right in the econ world when I went to a conference and everybody looked just like that. All right, he just—that's him. All right, so Rick Moranis. Uh, you know, that's what I think of when I think of economists. Uh, we know OLS, we don't know much else. Uh, market research, marketing science. So very quickly here, uh, the data are observational and experimental. The favorite tool. Uh, conjoint, marketing mix analysis, attribution analysis, these are all very, very common things for, for market research. Uh, the strengths, they're very applied. Uh, they often know Bayesian techniques. The weaknesses, they don't have much time series experience. And of course, you know, something like that, right? Like, can I ask you a question? So sur market research, market surveys, um, that's, that's really what I, what I think of. Uh, operations research. Operational and passive, or observational and passive. Favorite tool is optimization. All right, strengths, optimization and forecasting. So they happen to know those things. What don't they know? They have little knowledge of the data generating process. Every problem that they see is an optimization problem. Again, not bad, but for certain applications useful and certain applications not. What do I think about? I think about the traveling salesman problem, right? What's the optimal route to, re to move people around given the constraints that, that are faced, okay? A couple more of these before I get to the insulting most everybody in here. Engineering and physics. If you have machine data, people that come from an engineering background or physics background are particularly useful. Uh, they understand time frequency analysis. They understand the data generating process of co complex systems. What's their weakness? They don't really understand how humans make decisions. Okay? They understand how machines make decisions. They do a very poor job of how humans make decisions. All right? And of course, you know, I think about the time dimension or how water flows through tanks. Do you guys remember that? I hated that in school. Like that was maybe the main reason why I, I disliked math until I got older. Like I didn't, like, I liked the dollar sign in front of stuff. Like it was really boring if it was how fast is the tank empty. I didn't care, okay? Ah, uh, now the computer sciences. This is so much fun, right? So I, I, I blew my animation, so you will see. Um, computer scientists, data, don't care. Uh, favorite tool, really doesn't matter. I'm just worried about uh, validation sample error statistics, right? So I'm just worried, just classic machine learning type problems. Strengths, you, they understand prediction, they understand production. Weaknesses, they can't really talk about why things happen. All right, useful, but maybe not what you need all the time. There are some problems where prediction is the most important th th thing, and then in some cases it's not. And of course, what do I think of? I think of the hoodie. All right, finally, the data scientist. Data uh, come from different places, and they're somewhat agnostic to how it was created. Favorite tools, they know regression, they know trees, they know clustering. Uh, the strengths, great at data prep, uh, understand machine learning, weaknesses, I would say if there's a weakness, it's causality. Okay? So when you find a data scientist and you start talking to a classic, classically trained, that is they went through a master's degree program in analytics, which of now there's, there's hundreds of, all right? They tend to know a lot about, a, little, a lot of, a lot about, a good amount about a lot of things, right? And then causality is, is usually the thing that I find that they struggle with, okay? So for market research ap applications, probably not so hot. Uh, what are they? Well, they're hoodie wearers, except they, uh, they wear ties, okay? So the only difference between the computer, okay. So the only difference between the computer scientist and the analytics person is they, 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 they dress it up a little bit. They dress it up, right? Okay, so, um, what does a full stack data scientist know? Well, uh, they know R or Python really, really well. It's not okay to know SAS or Stata or MATLAB or eViews. All right? 
Does anyone know any of those? SAS, Data, MATLAB, eViews, any hands up for any of those? All right, MATLAB, hands up. Okay, so mostly MATLAB of the people that I just talked to. Now, not that, again, this is, this is me tongue in cheek. MATLAB data scientists are some of the smartest that I know, okay? But to be considering yourself a full stack data scientist, you really need to know R or Python, and really R doesn't count, okay? You need to know Python, all right? You also need to know web servers and web services. You also need to know Spark Scala and be able to talk about it. You need to know Hadoop. You need to know Java. You need to know D3. You need to know statistics and some optimization and some forecasting. And on top of it, you need to know business problems like churn, upsell fraud, inventory management, predictive maintenance, product recommendations. In other words, you gotta know, let's see if my picture's again, all those guys. Now, and they were supposed to come in one by one, right? But you got to know R and Python and, and a web server and Scala and Docker and uh, Spark and Hadoop. Any of you want to know all of those things? Nobody? Of course not. All right? But we keep advertising for the full stack data scientist and we keep thinking that we're going to be able to find this person that knows everything and in the real world that just doesn't exist. Okay? So here's the solution to the problem. Voltron, okay? The solution to the problem is Voltron. Figure out a way, as best as possible, to abstract away from the technology. So this is you're setting up a team. Understand that it's going to be impossible to find one person that satisfies all the needs. Instead, you're gonna have to build a collaborative team. You abstract away from the technology you have to think, of, think about piecing together teams. What type of problem am I trying to solve? Where can I go and find that person that can solve that little part of the problem? Instead of thinking about, I need to find one person that can solve the entire problem. If companies, especially big companies, and I didn't ask this, but does anyone here work for a publicly traded company? Big, big-ish, okay? So, you know, how do I solve this problem if I'm a big company? I figure out ways to pull little pieces together, all right? I Voltron it. Uh, and I do that with, a, with a, maybe a software platform that encourages vertical collaboration. So what do I mean? On the left, I have a data team, right? And this data team um, is composed of a bunch of data engineers, a bunch of data analysts, a bunch of data scientists, and some lines of business managers. All right, so big companies have teams like this. There are software out there that supports collaboration with these people, all right? And I like a lot of that software, all right? That software helps typically in this dimension. It helps horizontally, all right? Meaning I can see what other people are doing but I, I can only understand it if I'm like them. All right? And so data, sci data analysts can work together. The data scientists can potentially work together. The, the horizontal collaboration lets substitutable products, substitutable resources work together. What I'm interested in trying to promote is not necessarily the horizontal collaboration concept, but instead this notion of vertical collaboration. All right, so figure out a platform, figure out a group of people that when they, when they work together in a, in a vertical way can be Voltron, all right? Figure out a way that if I'm gonna build a data product or an analytic service, how can I grab different kinds of folks abstract away from technology, line them up, so with that, when I put them together, I have a kick-ass robot, okay? That's, that's, my, that's, I think, the vision for where our industry is gonna go, all right? And it's also gonna let us ascend into higher levels of management, all right? We have to figure out a way to get up the, up the ladder. Like, I'm tired of the MBAs, okay? I'm tired of the MBAs always being the boss. We should be the boss, okay? So we can only be the boss if we, if we figure out somebody else that can do our job. Our vertical collaboration can help that.
All right. Horizontal is important too, of course, but, but vertical is important. All right, so uh, that, was the, that was the totally agnostic, non-data IQ part of this talk. And then I'm going to spend like two minutes, I promise, just giving like a tiny little pitch for data IQ since we're a sponsor and I flew all the way out here. So I figure I, I can do it. And so you can cut the video at this point if you want. But um, now the punchline, of course, is that's a little bit what data IQ does, okay? So Data IQ or Data Science Studio is a platform for vertical collaboration. All right, all the stuff that I mentioned before, Scala or Spark, R, Python, MLlib, H2O, all that stuff, it's in the box, okay? But what we try to do is abstract away from technology and give there an opportunity for both types of users to, to, to touch the software at the same time, okay? Uh, in essence, we're a conductor of other technologies. We try to piece all, we try to use the best of the algo world, best of the data world, right? So we conduct Hadoop, we conduct Spark, we conduct R, we conduct Python, we conduct web services, that kind of stuff. Uh, and we throw it all together in a, in a seamless environment where you can build data products and analytic services. All right, so that is the official end of my talk. And um, I'd love an opportunity for some Q&A. If, if you're interested in, in maybe asking about what I see as far as trends in data science throughout most of the country, I have the, the benefit actually of visiting, so at SAS I visited hundreds of sites, uh, and at my last two companies I get to visit sites all the time, so I see what's happening in like the non-Valley part of the world. Um, so with that, maybe a question or two? Great, uh, thanks Ken. Yeah, uh, thank so, you. So we have time for a couple of questions cool. and then Ken will also be available upstairs there you go. for his office hours. So, there's gotta be something out there. Yeah, go ahead. What's happening in the non part of the world? Okay, so everybody, uh, so what is happening in the non-Valley part of the world? Um, a lot. Let me give you one example. So four years ago, I went to a big retailer in Northwest Arkansas uh, with, an, with, an alg with, a, with a, a big statistics company. And I walked through that, that part of the world uh, and the offices look like one of their large retail establishments. Um, low ceilings, drop ceilings, fluorescent lights, joint tables, not good. A year ago, I went back to that exact same building. The ceilings had been ripped out. New lighting was in place. I don't know if it had any windows or not. I don't think it was possible to put windows in. But it, it was virtually uh, indistinguishable from one of the, uh, you know, I, where was I? Facebook's office. In fact, it's nicer than Facebook's office. So what's happening in the rest of the world? They're catching up. Um, it's taking them a while, but they're understanding that they need to transition into a, being a software company. Um, that's true at big credit company in, in Virginia, same thing, right? You walk in, it looks like a software company. It feels like a software company. They, they're still lacking the, the, institu the, the like top to bottom institutional adoption of, of analytics. At me, um, but but it's getting there. All right, um, but you know I still talk to companies all the time that are sort of embarrassed that they don't have their Hadoop strategy worked out, right? Where we all have kind of just said, you know, Hadoop's old, so let's just worry about Spark and forget that. You know, um, it's cool. St it's it's good storage. Just you know, gr it's great for storage. You know, thank God I have a big supercomputer now. That's basically what we think of Hadoop, right? You guys ever thought about that? Like, why why did it take so like, why did it take so long for companies to get these big supercomputers? Well, nobody figured out that they could just, you know, that's th the real benefit of what ha the Hadoop cluster was was that it gave us supercomputing. Um, all right. Uh, anybody else? There's got to be another question out there. What industry do I think is 
touching um, data science, bringing data science in? Oh, an actual question. Yeah, go ahead. And what I find is that oftentimes the challenge is more than the tools. It's the fact that because of the different backgrounds, we speak very different languages. The way we frame problems about what is important, what is a reasonable assumption, and what is a reasonable objective yeah. is different. And so it's more of a cultural like bringing together uh, at uh, speaking the same language and yeah. than a tool. Is, is sort of my yeah. experience. So there is a, there, there is a, thank you. So there is a, you know, tools are one part of the issue. The other part of the issue is understanding where people come from and, and creating a common language. You know, part of the common language is, is of course, comes from continual learning and interacting with people. Not something that our group, of, that, that it's na is natural to us. We're not terribly social people, right? Uh, but finding, I mean, it's true, right? I mean, even, I, I wasn't always like this. I just, I got lucky. I, I was dropped into SAS, right? And so it, at SAS, I, I was an economist in, in a land of statisticians and optimization people and biostatisticians and market research folks and GIS people. And, um, and I got lucky enough to just bounce around and get, get their language. Um, but for the most part, everybody has the same fundamentals in that they understand regression. And so start from there, right? Start from a, start, but, but understand also that what is the objective of this particular subgroup? They are coming to it from an optimization perspective. So whatever regression concept that I think about, their goal is to, you know, find the best outcome. Then there's the market research person. Their goal is always going to be explanation. Uh, there's the, um, the uh, you know, the, the, the math person, right, which has a, has a, a, a preference for elegance. There's, there's always going to be some sort of differences among us. You know, f commonality is kind of the, the finding a simple, sim somewhat sim simple commonality, of course, is, is how you start. Um, you know, I'd say short of experience and time, I'm trying to think if there was any other, what else helped? I'd say, I, knowing that you don't know everything, being humble enough to ask, like what do you, what do you mean? So I did a, I did a talk, with, a podcast with a gentleman, I told you a little bit ago, but we were talking about Kafka. I don't know squat about Kafka. I'm still trying to understand it, right? But, but I think asking enough questions gets me closer. So we have to be okay with, I like being the dumbest guy in the room. It's fun. I'd always rather be the dumbest guy in the room. Life gets miserable when you're the smartest person in the room. Uh, so maybe that's the answer. Put yourself in a room with people smarter than you. Okay, uh, great.